Okay, so this is active filter design, lecture 23. In the last class, we looked at what non-idealities in the transconductors uh, can do to the filter transfer function. In the particular, we discussed two classes of non-idealities. Ideally, this current is supposed to be G m times V. Then we said that in reality, what happens is that there are capacitances at the input and output of the transconductors and uh, this is because transconductors are made using transistors. Transistors as you all know have parasitic capacitances associated with them. So, uh, these things will appear at the input and output and uh, since all transistors have finite output impedance in some form or the other. This output impedance will cause a finite output impedance for the entire transconductor. Ideally, you want the output impedance of the transconductor to be infinite, but uh, due to non-ideal effects in the transistors, they will eventually translate into a finite output impedance for the entire transconductor. The details of how RO relates to the output impedance of the transistors can only be determined once we put in place circuits which uh, realize a transconductor. So, at this point it is uh, uh, premature to talk about how R0 depends on the transistor properties, uh, but it is not too difficult to believe at this stage that uh, you know you, you will end up with some finite R0. So, the effect of uh, Ci and Co <coughs> cause the integrating the effective integrating capacitances C1 and C2 which we had in earlier schematics to change thereby modifying omega naught and Q, correct? And uh, how do you think we would be able to fix this? I mean one can in principle say that I know Ci, I know Co um, and uh, I know that the effective capacitance to realize a given omega naught and a given Q is so much. So, and I also know that Ci and Co will add to this effective capacitance. So, instead of having C, C1 which is what I needed from the calculations, I will make it C1 minus for example, Ci minus 2 Co depending on how many transconductors are uh, coming together at that node, correct. So, um, you know at a pinch one could say that the, this is a you know somewhat of a benign error. Uh, on the other hand, the effect of a finite output resistance is uh, as you can see the DC gain of the transconductor is supposed to be how much? The DC voltage gain of the transconductor is ideally supposed to be infinite. If R is infinity, if you push in a current into an open circuit, the DC gain will be infinite, but due to finite output impedance, the DC gain is, is Gm times R0, it is finite. And this finite gain of the transconductor what will this do to the properties of the filter? What will happen? Reduces the quality factor. What about the DC gain? Reduces DC gain as well as quality factor. Does it make sense? Okay. Now, moving forward, the next non-ideality is 
internal poles inside the transconductors okay ideally i is supposed to be gm times v correct but in reality you know that transistors do not react instantaneously to the applied voltage ideally in a transistor if you apply an incremental vgs it's supposed to result in an incremental current i which is gm times vgs but that does not happen and in uh, practice there is some delay associated with this transconductance. So, in other words the I of S is uh, can be modeled as G m divided by 1 plus S by omega p times V of S right. This is the simplest model one can come up with okay and as we kind of alluded to towards the tail end of the last class, what would you want omega p to be intuitively speaking? Okay, you want omega p to be infinity, a better form of saying infinity is very high and very high is a relative term in comparison with what? Omega, omega p must be much much larger than the pass band edge frequency that one you are that you are trying to realize right. In the second order example and the second thing translates to omega naught. Does it make sense? Then you would say much higher than the center frequency of the band pass filter, right. So, we will get a more quantitative, I mean this uh, omega p being the parasitic poles ideally we want them to be infinite, that is not possible. Next we will say we would like them to be very, very high. Then the question is what is the meaning of very, very high and it seems like uh, a reasonable thing to say that the parasitic pole must occur much beyond within quotes all the critical frequencies of the filter, right. And uh, the critical frequency of the filter is basically where all the action is happening, either the pass band edge in the case of uh, a low pass filter or the center frequency in the case of a band pass filter, right. Uh, but still that uh, does not leave us with uh, you know any numerical sense of how far this far must be and therefore it one must look into this with a little more care right. So, please note that in the ideal filter what do you think uh, you know it is a ratio of uh, the denominator must be a ratio of polynomials in S and every S must be multiplied by a term of the form what are the dimensions of s radians per second okay so if for example you have a low pass filter with uh, with uh, a denominator like this a1s plus a2s square plus plus blah 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 a n s to the power n right. What are the dimensions of a 1? Time and what must uh, uh, this be therefore of the form? Please note that our filter has got no r's, it has got only g m's and c's correct. So, a 1 must be of the form c by g m. What about a 2? must be of the form some c by some gm times some other c by some other gm 
okay and so on. So what is observation? Every S must be multiplied by a term of the form C by Gm. Yeah. Is this clear? Correct? Simply for dimensional consistency. Nothing else. Yes? Now, assume all the transconductors were ideal. Right? Assume all the transconductors were ideal and uh, you know, we, we determined the coefficients uh, uh, you know, starting from uh, the standard whatever polynomials or whatever and we had therefore since all the transconductors were ideal, we got the ideal response. Right? So, I will just draw for illustration sake a Chebyshev response like this. Okay. Now, what has happened? The transconductors are no longer, we are trying to figure out what happens when the transconductors are no longer ideal, but they are of the form Gm by 1 plus S by omega. Correct? So, if all transconductors are of the form Gm by 1 plus S by omega P, then what is happening instead of SC by GM, you now have SC into SC by GM times 1 plus, so this is ideal, this is with a parasitic pole, 1 plus S by all right. Does it make sense? <coughs> so, earlier, I mean, this can be thought of as replacing. Earlier, you had H of S in the ideal case, and now. Can you interpret this some other way? This can be interpreted as simply H of S times 1 plus S by omega. Does it make sense? Since all GMs are of the form GM divided by 1 plus S by omega P, it follows that one can interpret the effect of a parasitic pole in a transconductor as being as affecting the argument of the transform. Earlier you were, uh, you were finding H of S, correct? All that we need to do is replace S in that expression with S times 1 plus S by omega p. Correct? Now, let me remind you what the implication is when we say magnitude response of a filter. When we say magnitude response of a filter, we say this is mod of h of j omega, which is equivalent to saying I evaluate h of s on the this is the sigma plus j omega plane and mod h of j omega is obtained by plotting mod h of s as a function of if I plot mod h of s on the complex plane what kind of plot will it be? If I plot mod h of s it will be a 3D plot, it will be a surface plot for every value of s I will get a value for the magnitude and then if I plot it all over the plane, I will get some kind of 3D plot, correct? Now, what should I do to this 3D plot to get the magnitude of the transfer function? I will take a knife and slice it along the j omega axis. So, you can think of it as a loaf of bread, 
you slice it along the j omega axis and then turn the loaf this way and then the shape of that section is the mod h of j omega right okay is so therefore mod h of j omega is evaluating uh, this guy on the J omega axis, right? Now, what are we saying? The effect of parasitic pole is to modify the transfer function to H of S plus S square by omega P, right? Which is the same as saying H of. So, what is the magnitude response now? H of J omega minus omega square by omega. Okay. Does this make sense? Samir Nandi. Okay. So, all that, let me again reiterate, since I see so many blank faces, is that all that this is telling you is that to find the ideal transfer function magnitude, you take H of S and evaluate it on the j omega axis and find the magnitude of that complex number. Now, to find the effect of non-ideality, all that you need to do is instead of evaluating it on the j omega axis, you evaluate it on some curve whose equation is given by j omega minus omega square by omega p, correct? For a, for a given j omega, you find j omega minus omega square by omega p, evaluate h at this point, you will get some complex number, you find the magnitude of that complex number, that gives you the frequency response, correct? So, how will this guy look like as omega increases? Ankur, how? At DC, where will this be? It will be at 0, okay. All right. And what happens as omega keeps increasing? Yes, so where is that second term? What is that second term doing? It will not dominate. Please look at it carefully. So, as omega keeps increasing, we see that there is a real part, and so, in other words, this is a grossly exaggerated diagram, but this is how this goes. So, in other words, for the ideal response, one would evaluate H of S on the J omega axis. Some for some omega x, I would evaluate it at j omega x to get the effect of the parasitic pole. What I would do is have the same h of s, I simply change where I need to evaluate h of s, and it must be evaluated now at j omega x minus omega x square by. Does it make sense? Okay. Now, as a couple of <coughs> points, as omega tends to infinity, where will is the doing any difference between the two? Be any difference? No. 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 Yes, no, why? No. 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 No.
same point. Is that clear? At DC there is no difference between the non-ideal response and the ideal response because they are evaluating H of S at the same point. Correct? Alright? And at very, very high frequency also you should expect to see almost no difference because both are being evaluated at infinite. Okay? Alright. Now let's see what happens, uh, you know, in the middle. And for that, So what do you, I mean, uh, let me draw your attention to A. I draw the pole constellation of, for example, a Chebyshev filter. <coughs> what order Chebyshev is this? Fourth order. To find the ideal response, what would I have to do? I plot mod HFS, or rather evaluate HFS on the J omega axis. Now, if there is a parasitic force, what do you think I must do? We just discussed that I must evaluate this on this curve that I have drawn in red. Alright? So, can you comment on the magnitude response evaluated on this curve versus this line? of S drawn versus sigma and j omega, right? At the poles, what will happen? Yes, Chinnadurai, what do you think will happen at the poles? It will go to infinity, right? Okay. And now, all you are saying is that I will now take this 3D object with peaks at these poles. And then cut this 3D object along the curve which is going this way. And you know that close to a pole, the function is falling, the magnitude of the function is falling off like this, correct? And we have chosen those poles in such a manner that if you cut them exactly, cut this object exactly on the J omega, on the J omega axis, you get the nice Chebyshev response that you are looking for. This is a fourth order Chebyshev, so probably looks like this in the ideal case. In the non-ideal case, what should you think it must look like? At DC, it must be the same, okay? And then what do you think will happen? It will start deviating, okay? Will it be higher or lower? It will be higher, okay? And do you think the deviation will be more at the first peak or the second peak? Why second peak? The second set of poles has got a higher quality factor, right? And the moment the curve becomes closer to a pole, you will find that the, the there will be an increase in the magnitude response. And you can see that if you look at this set of poles, right? The at this point, for example, the pole is very close to the to this curve, right? In other words, the change in the magnitude response will be proportional to the, the ratio of this distance to that distance, correct? And you can see that for the, the low frequency part, that is not really changed, right? This peak will, this peak would, would occur due to this set of poles and you can see that with or without the parasitic pole, the change in the distance is not very much. Is this clear? So, when I, no, no, don't nod your head. If it is not clear, let me know. Is that clear? Okay. So, must do this. You understand? 
and as omega peak becomes larger and larger and larger, what do you think will happen? As omega p becomes higher, what do you think will happen? The curve will start tending to the j omega axis, right? So the peak will come down, and that makes sense, right? As omega p becomes larger and larger, the you would expect the ideal behavior. Dinesh Jayaraman, what is bothering you? As omega p goes on tends to infinity, what do you think will happen? What is omega p, by the way? What is omega p? What is omega p? Yes. Okay. And as that becomes infinity, what happens? Yeah, I know it becomes an ideal transconductor, but what happens to the response? The gassing man. <coughs> what happens to this curve as omega p goes to infinity? I say. That's all. You understand? Okay. All right. Okay. So that. So as omega p tends to infinity, this curve. will tend to the j omega axis. On the other hand, if omega p is too small, what do you think will happen? This curve will bear even more to the left side, causing what will happen when uh, this curve intersects the location of the pole? It will go to infinity. In other words, it means that the non-ideal filter has a pole on the j omega axis. You understand? Yeah, yeah, sure, right? If it goes even further, then you know uh, it becomes unstable, right? But uh, I mean, this is stuff that you you want to avoid, correct? So from this, we should be able to understand how much. What do we need to know now to figure out uh, how low omega p can be? I mean, we know we need to know two things. One, one we need to know the uh, we know we need to know. Let me just get rid of all this extra stuff. So as omega p keeps decreasing, we see that we see that this will start bearing to the left even more. And to figure out how low of an omega p we can tolerate, and why do I say how low of an omega p we can tolerate? Yeah, presumably, it is much easier to make a transconductor with low omega p rather than make something with high omega p, right? Because to make things faster is always difficult, it is always easier to make something slower, alright? So, we would be interested. In, uh, in C, how low omega p can be before you know catastrophic things can happen. As you can see here, if this curve intersects this, if this omega p becomes so low that this curve intersects this pole, okay, we see that what will happen? the uh, poles of the non-ideal filter will be on the j omega. j omega axis and that is a catastrophe, right? Which means that in pro all probability a filter does not work at all, right? Okay. So, to figure out how small an omega p is tolerable, what do we need to know? The only thing we need to know is the <coughs> location of these poles, 
right? One thing that is intuitively satisfying is that as the frequencies start to increase, in other words, if the bandage of the filter becomes higher, what can you say about omega p? How is the bandage of the filter related to the location of the poles? How, please listen to my question carefully and answer to the point. How is the bandage of the filter related to the location of the poles? So, if the bandwidth increases, all that happens is that this whole plot will get scaled, correct? So, and uh, so if the bandage of the filter increases, then presumably what will happen is that the poles move, you know, like this, okay? And what do you think will happen to the tolerable omega p? It'll, if you, if the omega p was the same, but the bandage of the filter increased, then effectively it is like moving the curve closer to the pole, correct? So, as if you want to, you know, maintain the same situation as before, what you must do is to increase omega p in direct proportion to the bandage and that makes sense. We all, we already said that the parasitic pole must be much higher than the bandage. So, which is equivalent to saying if the bandage increases, the parasitic pole must also increase by the same amount in order to have the, I mean, uh, uh, for the, uh, what do you call the parasitic to cause a similar effect as in the earlier case, correct? And what else uh, do you notice? Let us consider two filters, okay, let me, so these are two filters, filter 1 and filter 2, in which do you think a parasitic pole in the transconductors is going to cause more havoc, in the left one, even though they have the same omega n. And why do you think the left one is more sensitive to parasitic pole effects? As you can see, the the curve along which you must evaluate H of S is uh, something like this, right? All right. And as you can see, this is much closer to this this pole in the in the first example. This is much closer to this curve than here. Okay. So, the conclusion is that F1 should be more sensitive to omega p than F2. Okay. So, and uh, so, technically what is the difference between these two pole pairs? Both of them have the same omega n. So, the quality factor of filter 1 is much higher than the quality factor of filter 2, correct? So, putting the two arguments together, what do you say? What do you think uh, omega p? Okay, what are the two conclusions? The first one was as omega uh, not of the filter increased omega not being the bandaged frequency. If omega not increases, omega p must increase. If q increases, omega not in must, omega p must increase. So, what must matter is not simply, not just the bandaged frequency, but also the quality factor. So, what matters is, we will get to this uh, in uh, more quantitative terms uh, a little further now, but at this point, you must realize that it is not just the bandage frequency that matters, but also the quality factor. So, what matters is the omega naught or omega, what do we call it? Omega naught, I guess, right? Omega naught <coughs> q
the omega naught q factor of the pole pair is what determines the sensitivity to omega p, where omega p is the parasitic pole frequency of the transconductor. Okay. So, to give you a 3D illustration, I hope you are able to see this in with some clarity. Uh, this is the sigma, okay. This is the mag 3D plot of the magnitude of H of S, okay, evaluated on the complex plane. This is sigma, this is j omega, this is the origin of the complex plane, okay. It is like taking this plot and this is a section on the, so what the section you are seeing is a section of the j omega axis and what are all those peaks? They are all the poles, correct? And uh, this shows the first quadrant of the uh, whatever, the second quadrant of the S plane, correct? Where going into the plane of the paper is the negative sigma axis, right? And this right parallel to the plane of the paper is the j omega axis, correct? So, and uh, can somebody tell me uh, what order filter this is? No. It is 11th order filter because this is the first quadrant. So, this is one set of pole pairs, one pole, two, three, four, five. This uh, I guess you could get conned into believing it is either on the negative real axis or uh, complex conjugate pole pair. It turns out that this is indeed on the negative real axis. So, how many peaks do you see? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So, there will be 5 in the corresponding complex conjugate pair poles. So, 5 into 2, 10 plus 1, 11. This is 11th order Chebyshev filter, it turns out, okay? So, and if I slice it, I should expect to see the 11th order Chebyshev magnitude as uh, is visible. Okay. Now, all that I am doing is when there is a parasitic pole, I am evaluating this H of S, the, the, the 3D plot remains the same. It is just that the path along which I go to find the magnitude changes. So, can uh, you people actually see this magenta curve? Okay, all right. So I've just taken this solid loaf of bread and I'm now slicing it along a slightly curved path, and you, as you can see, the here, I mean, I'm actually scaling. You know, I'm I'm uh, probably quarter way up the mountain, hmm? and you can see that there is significant peaking here in comparison to the ideal, which is supposed to be. Does it make sense? Okay, so the same thing zoomed here, where I have just taken a small section of the sigma axis, right? Now, hopefully, the, it should be a lot clearer. This is somewhere where the pole is, okay? I am, uh, pole is somewhere around here, okay? And as you can see, the ideal one has got nice Chebyshev response as I expected, right? And because of the parasitic pole, the I am now evaluating this this thing on on some curve like this and you can see that it indeed peaks, all right? Okay. Now, it is time to put all the intuition aside and get down to the math, right? Uh, we will assume a second order pole pair, okay. We will assume that omega naught is 1, so that the pole pair has the equation S square plus S by Q plus 1. What are the roots of this denominator?
minus 1 by 2 q plus minus square root of 1 by 4 q square minus 1 okay it is understood that if they are complex conjugate pairs then the q is high enough and this must be 1 by 2 q plus minus j square root of 1 minus 1 by 4 q square correct. So, what is this part? Square root of 1 minus 1 by 4 q square okay and what is this part minus 1 by 2 correct all right okay now let me again remind you of something that you are supposed to have learnt in your basic classes which is If I have a transfer function of the form 1 by s minus p1 into s minus p2, correct, and p1 times p2 in the numerator, what is the DC gain of this transfer function? 1, okay. How will I graphically find h of j omega? If I want to find the magnitude of h of j omega at some omega, so it is simply nothing but evaluate evaluation of this function on the j omega axis. So, let us say I wanted to find h of j omega x, all that I will do is I want to find h of j omega x, correct. So, I plot j omega x on the s plane and then plot s minus p1 that is this vector then what else s minus p2 okay so this is s minus p1 this is s minus p2 correct let me call this uh, magnitude let me call this uh, a let me call this magnitude b. So, what is the magnitude of h of j omega x? No, please think carefully. Mod p1 p2 by mod of a b. Correct? You have seen this before? All right. Okay. So now that we understand this, let's get back to our Laplace plane. This is one by two q. Okay, and the y-axis is is almost one. Right? It's square root of one minus one by for q square, if q is large, q square is even larger and subtracting 1 by 4 q square from 1 will almost leave 1, which is equivalent to saying in a, uh, in a, when you have a filter with, uh, when you have a pole pair with a high quality factor, the y axis or the imaginary part is virtually equal to omega naught, right, okay, which is uh, in our case. For simplicity of notation, we just chosen that to be 1. Okay. Now, we have to evaluate the transfer function. In the ideal case, here, okay. and why am I interested in evaluating the, uh, the, the stuff there? It's just evaluation. I mean, I don't know why particularly around this frequency. The highest Q pole pair is where roughly the the band edge is, correct? 
okay so and we are interested in figuring out what happens to the gain at the band edge all right and so this must be approximately j1 in our example because we have chosen omega naught to be 1 all right so if this is j1 what do you think this is rather what is what is the x coordinate of that point minus minus it's, it's j1 minus omega p it's minus omega square by omega p which is minus 1 by omega p so in other words and what must and what is this distance? One by two cube. So, what can you say about the limit, the absolute limit for omega p? One by omega p must be definitely less than. 1 by 2 q which means that omega p must be greater than 2 q. Is that clear? Kartikeyan, is that clear or no? Yes, uh, this happens for omega not equal to 1. So, in general, what can you say about omega p? If I scale the center frequency to omega naught, omega p must be greater than 2 q omega naught. And please note that this 2 q omega naught is a very, it is a very risky thing. If you make it 2 q omega, if you make omega p equal to 2 q omega naught, that will give you the condition that the non-ideal filter has pole on the j omega axis, which is certainly something that you do not want, correct? So, this is a very, very, what do you call conservative, I mean, uh, no, very aggressive limit, I must say, right, okay. All right, this is a getting uh, E grade, okay. You are uh, just on the on the border. It does not mean that uh, you have done well, hmm? okay. So, what must you actually do? You must choose omega p to be much, much larger than 2 q times omega naught. Again, validating our intuition that the parasitic pole must be at least twice the omega q product of the pole pair that you are trying to realize. Okay. Now, let us try and estimate the increase in the gain of the, of the filter, right. So, originally what would be the gain mod of h ideal would be how much? At uh, j1, let me make that clear. This we have seen. What is the gain of a second order low pass filter at at uh, omega naught? It is q and how do we see that geometrically here? What is mod p1? What is mod P1 approximately? Approximately? What is the y coordinate of it? Approximately 1. X coordinate is approximately 1 by 2 q. So, q is high. So, what happens to uh, the magnitude? 
roughly 1 is that clear so this is 1 what about mod p2 this is p1 guys and this is p2 what is mod p1 is approximately 1 what is mod p2 okay what is uh, mod of j1 j1 minus p1 1 by 2q what is j1 minus p2 what is the, that that is this character people approximately approximately 2 if q is high it is 2 okay so you can see that this is nothing but q i mean so see it also turns out to be exactly q and uh, I mean that means that several of the approximations we made here all the errors have all cancelled out. I mean, do you all know that the the gain at omega naught for a second order low pass filter with the DC gain of 1 is Q? Yes. Okay. And then we made a whole bunch of approximations and still how can you get the correct answer? It can only happen if you know uh, the approximations magically cancel out, right? But the answer is Q and you, this is a way of geometrically seeing the same result. Is that apparent or is so I mean why is the class so dull today? Huh? Okay, all right. Now the reason why I did it geometrically is that it now forms uh, the basis for finding the gain at of the non-ideal filter. And this is what again mod p1 p2 still remains 1 okay now where must i evaluate h of j1 i must evaluate it there correct so what is uh, s my j1 minus I mean, now i need to find the lens of which vectors this vector okay and which vector is that clear okay so what is the length of this vector very good it's 1 by 2 q minus 1 by omega p correct and what is the length of this character approximately 2 so it's 1 what, what is that 1 by 2 q minus 1 by omega p times 2 correct and what is this let me simplify this for you it's 1 by one by q times one by q minus two by omega p which is q divided by one minus this right Okay. Now, if everything is scaled by omega naught, what do you think will happen? This will be q divided by 1 minus 2 q omega naught by omega p. So, what does this mean? If you now, I mean, let us say you did not know anything about the filter that the transconductors are bad and so on. How would you measure the quality factor? If you had a second order filter, low pass filter with a DC gain of 1, how would you measure its quality factor? I would just measure the gain at 
at omega naught, correct? Not at omega p, at omega naught, correct? And that would give me q. Now, if I repeated the same experiment with the non-ideal filter, what would I measure? I would measure a gain of q divided by 1 minus 2 q omega naught by omega p, which would then lead me to conclude that it would lead me to conclude that the quality factor has increased. Okay. So, in other words, omega p parasitic hole can be interpreted as enhancing the quality factor by a factor 1 by 1 minus 2 q omega naught by omega p. And we see that in the particular case when the parasitic pole is at 2 q times omega naught, what happens? The poles of the system are or on the j omega axis. Okay. Please also note that what is the order, true order of the system? Every GM has been replaced by GM by, so I mean technically speaking how many more S's have you added? There is the input transconductor, there is the damping transconductor and the two more transconductors. So, you added four extra poles into the into the network, correct. So, the true filter with non-ideal effects is indeed a very high order system, but at low frequencies, in other words, if omega p is very, very high, then for frequencies up to the pass band edge, you can kind of approximate it by a second order system, right. And if you do this, depending on how far away the pole is to this omega q product, we see that the, it appears as if you have a second order system, but with an enhanced q, right. And uh, since it is 1 divided by 1 minus something, you can see that it become very rapidly as omega p approaches 2 q omega naught, the q will increase very, very rapidly. And, and the entire filter will become unstable if 2 q omega naught becomes equal to omega p, right. For those of you, uh, the undergrads who did their uh, that experiment in the lab yesterday, when you replay the same thing will also happen with uh, active RC filters, okay. When you replace the op amp with another op amp with a lower gain bandwidth product, the effective Q you must have measured must have been higher than what you did with the, what you got with the, the higher Q op amps, I mean higher gain bandwidth op amps. And what is happening is precisely this. You understand? All right. So, the bottom line is that, yes, you can leave. Omega p is much, much great. Omega p must be chosen to be much, much greater than the, than twice the omega naught q product of the filter that you are trying to realize. Because S has been replaced with uh, yes, <coughs> but uh, there will be I think all the poles, all the uh, it's not as if you are having an independent number of uh, state variables because I mean not they're not because of meeting two transconductors are sensing the same same voltage, right? Which means that you know both the those internal poles are not really independent. Okay, all right. So we'll stop.